This video is about Turing machines. When talking about computers, we usually have the situation that on the one end we have a computer and a suitable computer program that processes some kind of, of input. Now, one might ask the question, is every problem actually computable? Can every problem be solved by computers if we uh, simply come up with a, with a program that's smart enough? And it turns out that the answer is actually negative. And the second question we would like to ask whether, even if it is possible, in principle, to, to solve a problem using a computer, whether it can be done efficiently or not. In the first part of the course will actually stick to the problem uh, which, which problems can be solved by computers with suitable programs. And this question might seem uh, quite theoretical, but in fact it has uh, a lot of practical applications. The properties of programs we might be interested in are, for example, termination. You've written a program in your program language, and you would like to know whether it terminates eventually or not. Or you've written some code, and you would like to know whether this part of the code is actually reachable. These are all uh, properties of programs that um, it will turn out that these properties are actually undecidable, that this, uh, these problems cannot be solved in general by a computer. To answer these questions, we need a formal model. The formal model of the computer should be, on the one hand, should be simple enough uh, to be formalized, so it will be much simpler than the computers we are all using now. Uh, but on the other hand, it should be powerful enough that everything that can be done with an arbitrary computer that we are all using can also be done by our formal model, at least in principle. And the formal model we are using in this course is a Turing machine. The history of the Turing machine goes back to Alan Turing, a British computer scientist who was also a crypto analyst in the Second World War. And he introduced the, con uh, the concept of Turing machines in his paper on computable numbers with an application to the Entscheidungsproblem in 1936. The first special feature of the Turing machine is that it has an infinite tape with a read-write head. This infinite tape is our memory. At e every step, the Turing machine will read a character at the current position of the head. It will write a new character at the current position, which can be the same character that was uh, read before. And then it is able to move the head to the left, to the right, or actually not to change position at all. Afterwards, it will change the state, the current state. Although we have an infinite tape, we require that the input is finite. The input should be on the tape initially, with the uh, head position on the first character of the input. The cells to the left and to the right are filled with so-called blanks, which is a special character indicating that the cell is empty. And this uh, special character may not occur in the input for the Turing machine. It's a special character. Apart from the storage or memory on the infinite tape, we have a finite control, which is similar to, for example, the uh, deterministic finite automata. Uh, we have a finite number of states. These are the states here. We have one initial state and one or more accepting states. These accepting states are also sometimes called final states. As a convention, we will not allow outgoing transitions from our accepting states. That's just a convention. Between two states, we might have transitions. The idea of a transition is, like here, for example, that if we have an A on the tape, the transition is enabled and the A is replaced by the X, by the letter X, if the transition is taken and the head uh, moves to the right. And afterwards, the state is changed from Q0 to Q1. To familiarize ourselves with the Turing machine as a, as a computational model, we'll have a look at this example here. We have an input on the, on the tape. The head is positioned on the first letter of the input, on the letter A, and initially we are in state Q0. Now, as the head is on an A, the enable transition is this one here. And so the enable transition can be taken, changing the input to an X and moving the head to the right and changing state to Q1. 
now we are in Q1, head is positioned on A, so the transition that's enabled is the one that stays in Q0 and moves to the right, so we'll take this transition, move our head to the right, and again the head is on the A, so the only enabled transition is this one here, the same, so we stay in Q1 again, move the head to the right, stay in Q1, now we have encountered a B, so we have to take this transition here, which leads us to state Q2 and replaces the B by an X. So now we are in Q2, head is on a B. The transition that's enabled is the one that stays in Q2, replaces the B by an B, so it doesn't change anything, simply moves the head to the right. We stay in Q2, encounter, encounter another B, so the transition will be the same, staying in Q2. Now we have reached a position on which the head, uh, head is on, uh, on a C. So we have to take this transition here, move to um, state Q3 and replace the C by an X. And still we go to the right. Now in this state Q3 we encounter the C, move to the right. And this is actually done to ensure that there are only C's to the right. And there are no other uh, letters to the right. So we continue, go to the right, go to the right, until at some point our head will be on a blank. Now here our head is on a blank and the blank is uh, symbolized by this uh, square cup symbol. Once we have uh, encountered uh, the blank we want to go to the left. So we change state to Q4, go to this state and this state actually skips all the letters and goes to the left until it finds another blank. So we go to the left until we find a blank. At some point we have found the blank, so our head is on the blank position here. Now that we are on the blank position, we change state and start all over and move to Q0. Now in Q0 we skip all the axes that are uh, uh, on, on the left, that are our markings on the left and repeat the same same idea for the next ABC triple. So we uh, look for our first A, replace the A by an X, then skip all the A's, skip all the X's, look for the first B, replace the B by an X, look for the uh, uh, next C, replace the C by an X and so on. So after we've done uh, the whole uh, cycle again we have um, the second A, B and C replaced by axes and we do it again and afterwards we have replaced every X, uh, every A, B and C by an X and now in this state Q0 we go to the right and at some point as we skip all the axes and there are only axes on the tape at some point in Q0 we'll find the, uh, the blank symbol. Now that we have found the blank symbol, we know that in the, in the loop above we have uh, replaced all the A's, B's and C's by X's. So there was an equal uh, amount of A's, B's and C's on the, on the tape. And what the Turing machine does now is it changes state and takes this transition and goes to the final state QF to, to accept the input. And this Turing machine here was actually a Turing machine to accept a to the power of n, b to the power of n, c to the power of n. It's a language that we know it's not context free, so for this language we actually need the power of Turing machines to accept it. The programming principle behind this Turing machine is actually uh, something that's quite typical for Turing machines. If you want to, to check, for example, if the number of a's and b's and c's are equal, you will check, uh, search for the first A, then change it, somehow mark the A that you've seen, then check for the corresponding B, mark this one as, uh, as done, and then check for the uh, C, and then mark it again as done, and skip all the, uh, all the parts that you've done, and repeat the, the cycle all over. So this, this idea of marking all the symbols that are processed already, that's quite typical for, for programming in Turing machines. 
and you've seen a disadvantage of this machine model. There's a lot of movement of the head. We, we have to uh, go through the input a couple of times to check whether the, the amount of A's, B's and C's are equal. Now to, to end the video, we'll give the formal definition of a Turing machine, like, uh, the, like the finite automata and uh, push down automata. Turing machine is a structure with uh, several components. We have a finite set of states. We have an input alphabet, sigma, and we have a tape alphabet, gamma. And uh, of course, the input is supposed to be on the tape. So the input alphabet needs to be a subset of the tape alphabet. So tape alphabet contains all the symbols that are allowed on the tape, whereas the input alphabet allow, uh, contains all the characters that uh, are allowed as input. And it's often quite useful to, to have a larger tape alphabet than the input alphabet, for example, the Turing machine we've seen uh, before uses a special symbol, the X, to, uh, as a marker. And this marker should, of course, not occur in the input. Um, the transition function is a mapping for uh, mapping the current state and the current tape symbol to a next state, to a, a next symbol that uh, replaces the current symbol on the tape and the head movement. Here we use the abbreviation LRN to uh, denote movement to the left, to the right, or neutral, meaning no movement at all. One of the states is the initial state, of course. We, we have to have one to, to start. And there's a special symbol, which we'll call blank, which is uh, also a symbol which may not occur in the input. So this uh, symbol is uh, in the tape alphabet, of course, but not in the uh, input alphabet. And finally, we need a set of accepting states or final states F.